religious pluralism. From the beginning of our country, when it formed and the leaders that helped start our land came here and sacrificed in so many ways, I think their uh, initial desires and intentions were for religious freedom. They wanted to be able to express their belief in, in a God however if they wanted to without any um, concerns about discipline and, and persecution. And that's a good, good thing. It's a great foundation. It's a very unique culture that we live in. But when you open up to religious freedom, uh, you do make yourself open to all types of faith that um, maybe they were looking for or maybe they were not looking toward in the future. In recent decades, we've had uh, quite a, an invasion, and that's a bad word, but quite a movement of uh, immigrants coming in, which is okay because you and I and all of us are immigrants here, so, uh, so it's not wrong to have that. But perhaps a, a, a unique blend of different types of religions have been brought in, and uh, we're probably not accustomed to some of that, uh, over the decades and over the beginning of our country. We can look back at the first century um, of this common era when Christ was walking around and the church was beginning. And in the Roman Empire, there was uh, a real experience of pluralism as far as religions. There were many gods, there were many religious groups that were formed at that time. The early followers of Jesus needed to be very cautious regarding those uh, that may abandon and get sidetracked from truth as was entrusted to them by Christ. And then there were those who just simply rejected all of what God had to do for them. The Apostle Paul warned us about times in the future, end-type times, which many people say sounds an awful lot like today. Paul wrote this, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, having nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with them. Paul sounds like he was describing our own culture in those words from 2 Timothy 3. And in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, he talks about a falling away of others and adds a few more sins in there that... Perhaps he didn't have in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. Falling away or departing from the truth. Uh, we call that apostasy. That's what it's called. Today we're going to be taking a, a look at the simple little letter. Although it's not very simple. It's actually quite complex. Uh, the letter that was written by Jude. And uh, I want to think about that because it really speaks about those who have fallen away from Christ, falling away from his teaching, uh, who have strayed from truth. I'm going to read not all of it today, but we're going to cover it all, but that's going to be a tough task. But I will start by reading the first four verses. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. Jude. So here it is. That's the letter. It's going to get started. We're going to jump into it. Who is this Jude? Actually, 
In the Greek, his name is really Judas. Now, I was telling Ann, I've read several times uh, recently as I study for this, the same quote, and I even heard uh, Michael Rendelic use it yesterday on his broadcast when he was answering one of the questions. But uh, someone about 100 years ago wrote that parents will name their kids John and James and all kinds of nice names, and sometimes they'll name their dogs Nero, but nobody will even name their dog Judas. Uh, well, in the Greek, this guy's name really is Judas. That's exactly what it is. Somehow, over the centuries, when it got translated from one to another, it ends up in our Bible as just Jude. I think we're probably doing him a favor by not calling him Judas. And it tells us here that uh, he is, quote unquote, a brother of Jesus. Now, there's lots of theories of James, the brother of Jesus. He's a brother to James, and there's lots of theories as to which James that is. But I'm going to simplify it by telling you I'm pretty confident. I think I agree with the majority who say that Jude is talking about his brother James, who happens to be the half-brother of Jesus. This makes Jude a step-brother to Jesus as well. The question then becomes, why didn't he just say that? Wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier? And there's probably some reasons, a couple of which is maybe he didn't want to be boastful. Maybe he just was uh, taking a humble approach. Some have suggested that maybe he felt some level of shame that he was a stepbrother of Jesus and was one of those, as they all were, that didn't receive him, didn't acknowledge him, didn't recognize him who he was until after the resurrection. Whatever, that's who I think this is. I think it's a stepbrother of Jesus, uh, brother, full brother of James, uh, who wrote the letter of James, who was the uh, leader in Jerusalem. And Jude is writing, and he tells us why he writes in verse 3. He says, you know, I was really excited. I really wanted to talk about salvation. What great stuff we have in Jesus because of what he did for us. I, I, I wanted to do that. When I started seminary, I considered that when we first moved out there, I, I told Ann, I said, you know, I'm thinking about taking a summer class. Before the whole thing started, I thought, I'm going to jump on this. She convinced me not to. That was really a good thing because I saw there was a class called um, Christ and Salvation. And I thought, wow, that's going to be a nice summer class. We'll talk about how we got saved and everybody will, and it'll be sharing. I was not prepared for the level of doctrinal study that you had to do for that class. So I'm so glad I didn't take it then because I would not have been ready at all mentally for something like that. There is such rich stuff that we have in Jesus. And that's what Jude wanted to write to them about. But he couldn't do that. Uh, he was driven towards saying, you know what, there is some caution that is needed among the body of Christ because of some who, uh, who have come in from the outside. He was very burdened about the faith. Now, as I was studying in, in the text here, um, I was kind of surprised, and I don't know what the answer to this is. I understand why the name Judas we would use Jude, and, and there's lots of questions. Like even the name James uh, in, the, in the Greek is Jacoba. It, it's really Jacob. But why we call him James, I have no idea. But what I really don't understand is clearly in the Greek text where it says in uh, verse 3 that I urge you to contend for the faith, it actually says I urge you to contend for the holy faith. And I haven't figured out why they don't have the word holy and I, I don't know if maybe some other translations do, but I haven't seen it in any. And it is the holy faith that we have, what God has given to us in the Old Testament, what God has given us through the life of, and teachings of Christ, what God gave to us through the teachings of Jesus' apostles. It's that whole content of Christianity. And Jude is really concerned about that and what we're doing. The problem is that some have secretly slipped in. And he describes them. They were godless. They looked good, but there wasn't any reality. There was no substance there. But on the surface, it looked pretty good. 
It says that they were vile people. Um, they would sin for grace's sake. There was a there was a slight movement of people that said, um, if God's grace is so wonderful, He can forgive us of anything, and we want to promote God's grace, then here's what we ought to do. We should sin more and more, and then get forgiveness from God so that He really looks good. So, you know, the more sin I do, the worse sins I do, and He still forgives me, really makes God look good. There was a a thought of some around like that, and that, of course, is uh, almost blasphemous, and it is blasphemous. And if you if you want to know more about that, you can read Romans chapter six, that tells us. Uh, I think Paul actually uses the phrase that we would translate, "God forbid," if somebody would think like that. God forbid that we would test God's grace like that. These people denied the deity of Jesus Christ. We call them apostates. An apostate is someone who receives the word of the gospel and then superficially believes it, at least for a while, but then falls away. Um, it's really dangerous to put names with this. Uh, you don't want to be the person that says, oh yeah, I know 17 apostates. There are this guy, this guy. You don't want to do that. That's a hard thing. Because we don't know the hearts of people. But there are people like that. There are people that are uh, shooting stars. We'll see that later. They, they shine bright for a while and then they fall away. They have a head knowledge, but there's no personal commitment there. They know the truth, but they never seem to apply it to their hearts and to live the way it is. John MacArthur, uh, in his little commentary, on the book of Jude, which is only 95 pages. There's what, 25 verses, 95 pages? The other commentaries I have were 150 or more pages on, on Jude. But John MacArthur calls his book, Unmasking the Pretenders. Really good. Here's some of what he says about them. Pretenders. They pretend to speak for Christ, but they deny his deity and reject his lordship. They pretend to believe the Bible, but deny its inspiration, reject its authority, and prefer its teaching to suit their own preconceived ideas. By the way, you know people like this. You may not know them personally, but you've heard them, you've heard, you've seen things written by them. He says they pretend to serve God, but in reality, they're serving their own selfish interests and desires. It's a rebellion against the Lord whom they claim that they know. They're pretenders. The Apostle John gave us a test to help us determine who is for real and who is not. Now again, we can only go by their words and their testimonies, sometimes backed up by what they do. But in 1 John chapter 4, there's two verses one of them I suggested to you today for our memory verse, the good side of it. But he starts off by saying, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. So if you want to figure out who's real and who's not, this is a good test. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come into flesh is from God. If, if they say, yes, Jesus Christ did incarnate and he came to earth, Jesus Christ did live. He did die a real death. He rose a physical resurrection. And, and he's alive today. Anybody who grabs that message and believes it and lives for that would be from God. But then he goes on to say, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. And you know who those would be. They would be the people who say, well, yeah, Jesus was a wonderful example and a great teacher. Uh, and Jesus, you know, lived a marvelous life, but I'm not so convinced that he was God. I'm not so convinced that he rose from the dead. I'm not so convinced that this happened. And, and in our culture, we had a real invasion of spiritual leadership across the country that does not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is, is God. Then he goes on to say at the end of that 
passage, John says, this is the spirit, the one who rejects, who doesn't accept it, who doesn't acknowledge Christ. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, he didn't say, aha, the Antichrist lives next door to you. He didn't say that. He says, there's that spirit, there's just that movement of people that are anti-Jesus Christ, which you've heard is coming, and 2,000 years ago, John said it's even here already, already in the world. That's a scary thought, because if it was in the world then, it's probably multiplied today in our culture. We see it all the time. So in verses 5 through the rest of the time, he really starts to give us a whole series, sets of triplets. I don't know why he picked that. Good brethren, everything comes in threes, that's good. But um, he has a triplets, and he's going to give you some examples. I'll read verses 5 through 10. These are examples that those who Jude was writing to would have known all about this. They would have known what this meant. You probably know a lot about it. So as though you already know this, about those people slipping in, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. That's one. Number two, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he's kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. That's the second example. And then the third one is, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example to those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand and what things they do not understand by instinct, like unreasonable animals, these are the very things that destroy them. If you have never read those verses before, you probably have a couple really unusual thoughts running through your head right now. One would be, I have no idea what some of those things are talking about. Uh, another one might be, that's pretty, pretty strong, shocking stuff. And it is. Those triplets, he, he mentions things that they would have known, maybe you know. For instance, Israel. Look at all that happened to Israel when God miraculously delivered them out of bondage of Egypt and then kept them for 40 years, provided for them, guided them, and yet still a lot of them rebelled. They complained and they murmured and they rebelled against God and some of them were destroyed in the desert because they rejected God. He judged them. The fallen angels, you may or may not know much about this, uh, and it'll get long, complicated. See me later if you need more info. But there's, um, in the Old Testament, there were some angels that had left the heavens, and they say they inhabited the bodies of some men, and that they had sexual relations with women, and that a certain race of people, the Nephilim, uh, which basically means giants, um, were conceived out of that. And, and God judged them and, and held them into a, a level of darkness. There's a containment place for them that they're being held into the final judgment. The point there is he's trying to tell them, you know examples of active disobedience. How can an angel created by God who dwells in his holiness, how does he rebel against God? That's ridiculous. Sodom and Gomorrah. The prediction of judgment that was there for them that was fulfilled. And everybody reading this letter in that day would have known that God fulfilled that judgment. found it quite interesting this last week that um, the, so the subject of sodomy was big this week in our Supreme Court. Our justices were studying and thinking about how do we define and, and, and apply rules and laws to... Marriage. What is marriage? What does it constitute? I wrote on Facebook, I hope that the justices realize that as they try to define 
marriage that they're going to stand before the judge someday who instituted the institution of marriage. They're going to have to be accountable for whatever they come up with. Here he's reminding them that, you know, that judgment was really sure for those people who perverted the rules and laws of God. God deals strongly with those who turn their back on him and who ignore him. Then you talk about angels. Michael. Michael was an archangel, which just means he's one of the top chief ones. He had a lot of responsibility. Most of the time when we see Michael mentioned in scripture, it's almost always, in fact, I don't know an example, to, uh, an exception to this, but it's always around some form of great spiritual warfare that's going on and he's involved, whether it's in the book of Daniel uh, or something like this. And you're saying to yourself, disputing over the body of Moses? Well, you may remember that Moses was not permitted into the promised land and God took him, and it says that he was buried on the mountain, and I don't know what exactly it means, but here's one application that it could mean. Couldn't you just see somebody going up there and digging up the body of Moses, and then next thing you know, you got a shrine and everything else, and uh, Michael wouldn't let him do that. Michael would not let Satan have any access to the body of Moses, when, and, and Michael, was fighting against Satan, but here's something I think that's interesting. He, he would not himself fight in his own power against Satan, even though he's an archangel, but he called upon the Lord to rebuke him. I can remember years ago, I don't hear it a whole lot more, but on some of the, uh, the unusual channels of religious stuff on TV, I can remember a lot of them saying about, you know, you need to you fight demons, you need to rebuke Satan and do this, and yet the archangel wouldn't do that. I don't understand where we think, who do we think we are to try to take on Satan like that? We have to stay centered in the power and the might of Jesus Christ. Now I'm not going to read the next couple verses just because of time, but verses 11 to 14 he says, you know, these outside people, these apostates, have slipped in with us, and they're here. We can see them. They're blemishes at our love feast, the communion services. There's some that come into those fellowship meals and they mingle with us, and we don't even realize it. He, he describes them as clouds that come during the drought. I can remember back in 88, we had a really bad drought here. And I can remember one day that there were some clouds coming in. I thought, oh, it's going to finally rain. I don't have to water the whole garden today. And those clouds were there for hours, and then they left and nothing happened. The point is how disappointing these people are. They just look so great. It's like, oh, the promise is finally coming. And then the wind just blows it right on by. Doubly disappointing. He describes them as wild waves, like tsunamis, out of control, or wandering stars, shooting stars that shine and fly across the sky. They're so bright, and then they fade away within a split second. Make your wish quick. Very, very bad. Look at how he sums them up in verse 15. It says, to judge everyone, this is what they do, see the Lord's coming, and to convict all the ungodly, of all the ungodly acts they have done, and all the ungodly ways, and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Did you catch that these are ungodly? I mean, that's just fun reading. When there, so many times he mentions about the, they're ungodly people. And the deeds they do in verse 16, these men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves flatter others for their own advantage. These are false teachers who do more harm than just to themselves. They damage the reputation of Christ and his church. Now when we think of apostasy in our land, we really do need to think across the bigger spectrum. I, I don't think it's really appropriate to apply somebody 
teaches your Sunday school class and they misquote a verse, that doesn't make them an apostate, okay? Uh, we need to be careful about some of that stuff. But there are apostates across our land that are in pulpits that are teaching false doctrines and false precepts. Someone wrote this, and I don't remember where I got this from. I wish I wrote it down. But it, they said, perhaps the past decades of compromise has been a test. Or it could have been Satan softening us up for the real onslaught of sin and corruption to infiltrate the church. You know, we've been going through compromise in our culture, serious, biblical, principle compromise for well over 50 years in all kinds of areas. I've been saying for 30 years, I've been threatening for 30 years to write a book that I would call, What If We Were Wrong? <laughs> On all these different doctrinal compromises that we have made. I think we are. I think we have been. And maybe that's just the way Satan is doing it, to soften us up and to get it so that uh, all kinds of sin and corruption can come in. Francis Chan, who many of you don't have a clue who is, but there's a lot of you that are smiling, Carrie. I saw that. And you know Francis Chan. This guy is great. Francis Chan recently said, and I'm talking within the last two weeks, that he believes that the church in the United States of America is about to experience first century type persecution. If you know anything about the first century, that's not a good message. That's what Francis Chan thinks is coming our way as, as a group of people. The danger to our nation in this present century doesn't come from those who faithfully learn and teach and proclaim the word of God. They're not the danger. Now they may be telling you that in the media and in the culture, but those who stay firm to the word of God are not the danger. It comes from those who deny the most holy faith. They're the ones who we need to be worried about. In verses 17 through 23, it'll tell us um, of, of something for us believers to listen to. It says, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ were told. They said to you in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit but you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Here's a couple things I think that can help us to contend. First of all, we need to study and obey God's Word. That, that's pretty basic stuff, but it's also very critical, essential stuff. Unless we know what the truth is, we're never going to be able to determine what the error is. We also need to witness to the truth of God's Word. The Bible's under attack everywhere in our culture. We must defend and proclaim that salvation message. It doesn't mean we need to start a campaign or anything, but just stand firm when, it, when it's appropriate to do that. We really need to support and encourage those who, are, who faithfully teach God's word. I'm thinking more on the national scene, but there are some that have proclaimed uh, what God says on certain things because they get asked and and then all of a sudden they come under attack by everybody when all they do is explain God's truth and His grace and, and uh, they need our support, our encouragement, and our prayers. Prayerful support, very vital for them. And then we need to develop strong leadership in the church. Uh, we need more who can defend the faith and more who can teach others how to do that as well. He ends with a great benediction, and it goes like this. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, 
and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.